All right. Well, I do love keeping to a schedule. So for the sake of time, we've packed agenda here. I think I'm going to kick it off and turn it over to our presenters. So um, without further ado, we will begin. So welcome again, everybody, this to the Accessible IDA data, the what and the why. Uh, and with us today leading the discussion will be Heather Evans and Mark Harness. So Heather, Mark, take it away. Thanks, Darren. This is Heather speaking. Uh, yes, welcome to the Rhonda Weiss Center webinar, Accessible IDEA Data, the What and Why. Uh, next slide, please. So today we're going to talk about why data access is important to people with disabilities and the rationale for their data use. We will provide some examples to help show how disabled people use or might use IDEA data. We're going to go into some depth discussing how people with different types of disabilities access data, highlighting what makes data inaccessible for many users. We're going to review the principles of accessibility, that is, outlining ways to make data accessible. And throughout our conversation today, we're going to urge you to think concretely about how you can change your organizational practices to provide equivalent IDEA data access to people with disabilities in your state. Next slide. So first, we just want to start off uh, introducing ourselves. We know many of you were here for our first webinar. Um, my name is Heather Evans. I am a white cisgendered woman. I use she, her pronouns. For those with low or no vision, I have brown and gray chin length hair. I'm wearing a black top under a teal cardigan. I identify as disabled. I have a chronic illness that causes a variety of uh, physical and cognitive impairments that flare and fluctuate depending on different circumstances. In addition to the lived experience that I bring to this work, I have a PhD in sociology. I'm a currently uh, an acting assistant professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Washington, and I am faculty in the UW Disability Studies Program. I'm also currently the Director of Research for the Northwest ADA Center and have the pleasure of working with Mark as one of two Associate Directors for the ADA National Network Knowledge Translation Center. So I give you this information just to provide the context that this work is very important to me, both personally and professionally, and to help you understand how I kind of approach this work. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague uh, to introduce himself. Great, thank you, Heather. Hi, everybody. My name is Mark Harness. I use he him pronouns. I'm a white man with brown hair and blue eyes. I'm wearing a, a black polo shirt, uh, and I have uh, transparent reading glasses on. Um, I uh, do not identify as disabled, but I have a long history of working in disability fields, uh, starting in special education um, and moving now really more into the realm of rehabilitation medicine. Um, uh, my work is, is largely connected to disability. For a while, I was uh, director of the Disability Studies Program. I've just stepped down from that. Um, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine. And as Heather notes, I direct the ADA National Network Knowledge Translation Center and have recently started as the director of the University Center for Excellence in Developmental Disabilities. I think one of the things that's particularly connected um, to the discussion today is that um, as part of our uh, our center, we also have the Washington Assistive Technology Act program, which is a program that provides demonstrations and loans of assistive technology to help people decide what kinds of, of assistive technology they need in order to access information. So I'll be talking to you about some of that. And Heather, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Next slide. So aligning with our agenda for today, really our goals or objectives for this webinar is to help understand the importance of data access for people with disabilities, to understand how people with disabilities access electronic data, to understand barriers to access, and to identify standards and guidelines that support data accessibility. So to be clear, our goal today is to provide a foundation for understanding the need to make data accessible and available to all users. The nitty gritty nuts and bolts of how to implement the practices we're gonna to review today, that's precisely the purpose of the Rhonda Weiss Center. So we're gonna give you the why and what, the skilled and talented folks at the Weiss Center are gonna provide Provide the how. And as we go through our talk, we invite you to put questions or comments in the chat, and we will address them probably at the end, uh, or you can wait and voice your questions after the presentation during Q&A. Next slide. 
So let's begin with why is data access important for people with disabilities, people like myself? Next slide. In part one of this webinar series, Dr. Harness and I define disability according to U.S. federal civil rights legislation. We also summarize the history of exclusion and segregation that led to the disability rights movement and the passage of disability civil rights legislation, such as the Individuals with Disabilities Act, or IDEA. On this screen is an image of a banner with the central panel depicting people on a march and words such as disabled people fight back, equality, access to work, society makes, <clears throat> makes people disabled, not the disability, smash the barriers which exclude us, no cuts to disability services, we are one, and powerlessness equals pain. Under these images is the disability rights slogan, nothing about us without us. Or in other words, next slide. In other words, without access to data, teachers, lawyers, parents, policymakers, researchers, and everyday people with disabilities cannot use empirical information to inform their decision making. Without being able to measure where things are at, we cannot advocate for change. Without empirical benchmarks, we can't tell whether the changes that we do implement are making any difference. Again, without those benchmarks, we can't tell if things are getting better or maybe worse. Next slide. To put it more simply, access to information is power. Having power means having a seat at the table, hopefully a height adjustable table. Uh, but without information and inclusion, it is far more difficult to exercise agency in an efficient and effective manner. Next slide. So in our last webinar, we spent considerable time defining and discussing the far-reaching impacts of ableism. That is the set of assumptions and practices that promote differential and unequal treatment of people because of actual or even just presumed differences in how bodies may look or function or how minds may work. We talked a little bit about implicit and explicit bias. Comparing bias to an iceberg, where the part above the surface that you recognize, explicit bias, that's usually just the tip. The bulk of the iceberg lies under the water's surface, just as the bulk of disability bias lies underneath that line of consciousness, referred to as implicit bias. This is where those assumptions and stereotypes that we have all been exposed to our entire lives nestle into our unconscious and then emerge in subtle ways, influencing our decisions, our actions, and our behaviors. Next slide. So we're not going to mince words here. We want to make it abundantly clear that producing inaccessible data is a form of ableism. Ableism rests on the assumption that to be non-disabled is not just the norm, but it's the ideal. In the world of data, this assumption generates and sustains the myth that very few data users are or will be people with disabilities. This is despite the fact that all of us have, or at least will, spend some significant time in our lives living with impairment. Recall from our last webinar that just over 25% of American adults report having disabilities. Next slide. Ableism leads to differential and inequitable treatment, that is discrimination. So compiling and posting data before ensuring it is accessible provides able-bodied users access while excluding disabled users or making those users wait for access. That is inequitable treatment. And remember, treating disabled and non-disabled users differently is a form of discrimination. Next slide. Ableism has been documented to be pervasive across policies, the built environment, social attitudes, and practices. A formal policy or even an informal practice of making data accessible, quote unquote, later or until specifically requested, communicates that disabled users are less important 
than non-disabled users. And I can tell you from experience, having had to navigate and extract data from a variety of government agencies, figuring out sometimes just who to contact is quite a chore in itself. Going through multiple people or offices, determining how or what special form to submit to request. And then when you finally get to someone uh, who's the point person, often having to walk them through exactly what I need data produced in, in different forms in order to access, especially given that every database, every query system, right, is very individualized. Going through this process to get access to so-called publicly available data is so frustrating and exasperating. Uh, you know, I invite you to store the image of me grinding my teeth so that you can recall that image in the event that you encounter a disabled user who might seem a little short-tempered by the time they get to you. Because finding who to contact submitting special requests, having to maybe tutor people on how to make data accessible places an extra burden on disabled users. Next slide. Lastly, recall from our previous webinar that ableism is deeply intersectional and it's rooted in other isms, classism, racism, sexism, ageism. So extra burdens, burdens that emerge out of socioeconomic difference, language differences, educational attainment differences, just to name a few, those extra burdens in accessing data can exacerbate barriers that are already faced, particularly by multiply marginalized users. None of us are who we are because of our race or our, only our gender, or our age, or our nationality, or faith, or disability. We're made up of all of those things. No individual has only one identity. For me as a social scientist, I need to be able to slice and dice data in a multiple different ways in order to tease apart and really identify patterns. Examining outcomes across multiple demographic characteristics helps understand and remediate intersectional marginalization. And here I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Harness to go into some specifics on how many disabled folks like myself actually use IDEA data. All right. Thank you, Heather. So now that we've talked about why it's important for people with disabilities to have access to IDEA data, we wanted to give a few examples of information they might want to access. And so we've developed a few data use scenarios about information that can be found in the IDEA data that could be useful and interesting to lots of people, but particularly to people with disabilities. So one example of data use is that people might want to learn about the practices of high-performing schools and districts, and they might, might ask, are there districts where students with disabilities perform comparably to students without disabilities. And if that's true, what, what teaching or administrative practices are the same or different? They might be interested in evaluating, evaluating equity of resources that are available across the state. So questions in this category could be things like, is there equitable access to teaching staff and to service providers, regardless of the location within a state, rural and urban, for example? And what's the ratio of speech pathologist FTEs to students with primary disabilities of speech language impairment across states, or for example, across three states and, and making a comparison? Other things that people might be interested in are, are looking at equity among discipline usage, which has been a, a big concern and a big issue. So a question might be what percentage of those who receive out of school suspension or expulsion for greater than 10 days are Black or African American students with disabilities? Uh, touching on that intersectional uh, element that uh, Heather talked about. People might be uh, interested in, in ensuring that students with disabilities are participating in state assessments or alternate assessments um, and to hold states and districts accountable for the academic achievement or perhaps lack of academic achievement of students with disabilities. So they might ask what percentage of students with disabilities participate in the state assessment? What percentage participate in the alternate assessment and how do they do? What are their outcomes? And finally, people might be interested in ensuring that districts implement policy procedures and practice as they are supposed to. So a question might be, 
How many mediation requests did State A have in the past year? And out of those, how many were actually held? And these are just a few examples of the types of really important critical questions that people might want to ask about students with disabilities. And I think you can see how having this information would allow for advocacy, for the development of new programs, for encouraging districts to take on new practices and so forth. So given that, given that there are important questions to be answered through the data that are provided by states, the next question you likely have is what makes IDEA data inaccessible? Uh, and to understand that it's really useful to talk about the way that people with different types of disabilities access data when they're using information technology. Before I start talking about that though, I wanted to note that not all disabilities are relevant to information access to data access. So for example, it's possible that someone who uses a manual wheelchair or a walker for mobility wouldn't have difficulty accessing information from a computer. However, there are some disabilities that directly affect access, and these include disabilities related to vision, fine motor skills, hearing, cognition or thinking, and reading. And so I'm gonna be talking about each of those categories of disability. So let's start by talking about vision. People with visual impairments who can't see clearly or at all may experience access challenges when information is only available visually. And so we often talk about two categories of visual acuity, low vision and blindness. And we use this distinction because it makes a difference in the type of assistive technology that people use. So many of us require glasses to support our ability to see. I'm, I'm wearing glasses right now. People with low vision have a visual impairment that can't be fully corrected with glasses, with contact lenses, or with surgery. So they can still use their eyes to access information, but they may have central vision loss or peripheral vision loss, or they might have vision that's blurry or fuzzy. Now, in contrast, people who are blind typically don't have much, if any, functional vision. They may still see light or color or shapes or movement, but not clearly and not with enough detail to actually use the information. So then how do people with low vision or blindness access information from information technology? First, just know there are lots of different types of assistive technologies, and I'm just going to touch on a few today. But generally, people with low vision will use devices that magnify the information on the screen. And uh, you can see uh, magnification in the computer in the top right image on this slide. So this person's using a screen magnification software called Zoom Text. And that software provides a variety of functions for enlarging and navigating the screen. People with low vision may also prefer different types of color modes or contrasts on the screen. Uh, and the image to the top left shows the color and high contrast modes that are automatically built into Windows, but people may um, need to customize those uh, for, for their, own, um, uh, their own vision needs. Um, people who are blind, they often need to access content in a way that's not visual. So typically that means that the graphic information has to also be available as text. And I would imagine many of you are familiar with the idea of adding alternative text to images or alt text. So that's an example of taking graphic information and making it textual. So when information's available textually, someone who's blind can access the information auditorily, they can hear it. And the image on the bottom right shows someone using screen reader software on a smartphone, and they're listening to information from some application. Maybe they're, maybe they're listening to an email. The image on the bottom left is an example of a refreshable Braille display. And you may know that Braille is a tactile language. It uses raised dots to represent letters and numbers and punctuation. And you read it by running the fingers of your hand over the dots. And those dots are arranged in cells. Each of those cells has six dots. And this is a refreshable Braille display. It, it connects to a computer and it has little pegs that pop up to form the Braille letters. And it, it refreshes. So as you read down line by line, uh, the refreshable, uh, the, the pegs will pop up and, and create different letters. Um, the version here also has keys that allow people to type in Braille. So the six keys up there on the top of that Braille display 
match the six dots in a braille cell. All of that information is just to say that the only way that someone using a refreshable braille display will be able to access information is if there is text for them to access. And so, uh, so having um, textual information uh, to support graphic information is, is very important. So given those approaches to accessing information using assistive technology, what makes data inaccessible? So um, what, what happens on the development side that makes data inaccessible for people with disabilities related to vision? First, text or numbers can be created in ways that aren't available to assistive technology. So a common example is that you can create a PDF that's just a picture of a page or of text. So it's kind of like, if you took your smartphone and took a picture of a piece of paper, it would it would be a picture. It would still graphically show text, but there's no text actually there for a, for a refreshable braille display or screen reader to read out loud. Um, the only way to have that happen would be if you also ran optical character recognition to identify the text that's in that image. So people with vision can read it, but there's no textual information for the assistive tech. And of course, that's primarily a problem for people who use screen readers or refreshable braille displays. Um, another problem is if graphics convey information. So for example, if you have a, a conceptual model or a process model that's graphical, those graphics need to be described using alternative text in order for them to be available to assistive technology. And then people with low vision may have difficulty if the contrast is too low and it's not adjustable. This is something that we see pretty commonly um, sometimes people really like soft contrast um, visual design, um, but they don't realize how it affects people with low vision who, who need sharper contrast, contrast in order to be able to read the information and see the information. Um, and then another issue that, that often comes up is color coding. And so um, this is something that we do a lot where we assign different colors to things and those colors are have a key and they mean something. Uh, so, for example, if you had a, a spreadsheet where all the green cells represented District 1 and the blue cells represented District 2, but there was not another way for people to, to, to identify um, that those, were, those cells were connected to those districts, that would be inaccessible as well. And then finally, and this is relevant to the Y Center, uh, people with vision disabilities can have difficulty with data visualizations that are too complex and are not adequately described. Um, and so think about, for example, a visualization that allows you to take a slider and move it and see how data have changed over the last 10 years. Um, that may be very intuitive to some of us to see that and to see how things are changing, increasing or decreasing over time, but it can present a really significant challenge to people with disabilities of vision. So moving on, let's talk about fine motor skills. People with fine motor disabilities have challenges doing things like pinching, uh, grasping, touching. Uh, they may have trouble holding their hands in a stable way. Um, think about tremors, for example. Um, they may have difficulty with precision, you know, hitting a key or hitting a place on the screen. And th this happens because of disabilities in the fine motor control of their arms, hands, and fingers. And it's important to note that these actions are often tiring um, because there's a lot of control and thought and care that has to be taken to, to, to manage your, um, your limbs. And so fatigue is, is a common issue for people using a computer who have fine motor disabilities. These disabilities vary a lot based on disability type. So again, tremors, if you have Parkinson's, you might have tremors. Um, if you have quadriplegia or stroke, you might have difficulties grasping or pinching or reaching. So people with fine motor disabilities tend to use adapted computer inputs, uh, like adapted pointing devices and adapted keyboards. They may also use voice recognition to enter text if they have access to, to use their voice. So um, I'll talk a little bit about some of these examples. And then finally, they may rely on ergonomic setups to support their access to um, computing devices. Um, and in this example, you see someone sitting in a power wheelchair in this picture, someone in a power wheelchair, they have a, a compressed keyboard sitting in their lap. It's a smaller keyboard. Um, and he has a pointing stick that's attached to his hand and he uses that to activate keystrokes. 
I'll give you a few more examples. In the image in the upper left, you see a woman sitting in front of a computer. She's also using a pointing stick to activate keystrokes. Um, and the keyboard in front of her is enlarged and it has much larger keys and larger letters and numbers. You may not be able to see, but there's an overlay across that keyboard. It's a clear plastic overlay that helps her target keys without activating the neighboring keys. And then finally, you can see that her arm is resting on an ergonomic support arm, which she can move back and forth. And it means that she doesn't have to hold her arm up, um, but she can rest it there and that conserves her energy. The image to the right shows a man in a reclined uh, power wheelchair. He's in front of a tall desk that accommodates the size of his wheelchair. His arm just arms rest on the armrest in front of him. And in front of him, you see an, an, just, an adjustable arm, um, and there's a device connected to it that looks kind of like a, a box with a straw on it. And this is a mouth-operated joystick. So he can, he can use his mouth. He doesn't have use of his hands. He can use his mouth and his tongue to move that. And that gives him mouse access to the computer. Um, and you may not see, but there's a, a, a dark uh, sort of cylinder there. And that's a boom mic. Boom mics are targeted mics that point directly at his uh, mouth um, so that even if he talks quietly, um, it can hear him. And so he can use speech to text uh, technology, probably like Dragon Naturally Speaking. I just wanna show you those examples. Every person is gonna have an individualized solution based on their needs, but hopefully this gives you a sense for the types of assistive technology people might use. And so what makes data inaccessible for people with fine motor disabilities? You know, a primary issue is fatigue. Just think about using a pointing stick to type a sentence. And then think about doing that where you have challenges in fine motor control that require you to be very careful and very precise. Uh, think about what it might mean to have to do something that requires multiple clicks or repeated operations or tasks that require drag and drop. Uh, that's often a, a big problem. Um, and in addition, systems that require the use of touch screens and don't have alternative keyboard approaches uh, or systems that require multiple key presses like an alt control G, um, those can be really inaccessible as well. What about disabilities related to hearing? So since th these issues um, are, you know, the issues that we're focusing on are related to content, <laughs> sorry, I just, Mess that up. Issues for people with hearing are related to content with audio that can't be heard. And so you might think that doesn't really apply to data access, since typically people are accessing data um, by looking at something on a screen. And in some ways you'd be right, but it does affect things that kind of relate to data access. It affects access to informational materials that are presented in audio or video. It, it, it affects people's ability to participate in in-person or virtual events. And so it's, it's critical, I think, to consider um, hearing within this, this space as well. As we did with vision, we divide hearing into two categories. Those include hard of hearing and deafness, and people who are hard of hearing may have mild to severe hearing loss. They might use hearing aids or other ampl amplification devices like uh, wireless FM systems. Um, and they may also choose to use sign language. People who are deaf, on, in contrast, have little or no hearing, and they primarily use sign language. Um, and, and both people who are hard of hearing and deaf will use captions. Um, it's important, I think, to note, and you probably know, but deafness is both a, uh, a physical condition, and that's often, when you see it written, it's written as a lowercase d, deaf, but it's also a cultural identity for people who are part of the deaf community. And when, when that's written, it's often written as an uppercase D uh, deaf. So important to acknowledge that difference for the deaf community. So here are some examples of assistive technology that are used by people with hearing disabilities. People who are hard of hearing, as I noted, use amplification or hearing aids. And the image in the lower right uh, has a young man with a hearing aid. Um, and people who are deaf typically will use ASL, uh, American Sign Language, they might use um, alternatives to sound, for example, vibrations or visual alerts, and they'll certainly use captions um, in virtual meetings and in live settings. Um, although, as I noted, a lot of people with hard of hearing who are hard of hearing will also use captions, and frankly, a lot of people who hear just fine like captions as well because they they do help us um, to follow and to understand what's been said. 
So what makes data inaccessible? It's pretty straightforward. Uh, the primary issue for people who are hard of hearing or deaf is audio that doesn't have a textual or visual alternative. And so that's why we have to have captions. We have to have some other way of signaling the sound um, that's happening. And then I'm just gonna talk about two more areas, cognition and reading. Um, cognitive disability uh, can affect uh, someone's ability to access and understand data for sure. And cognitive disability is when a person has trouble remembering, uh, trouble learning new things, concentrating or making decisions that affect their everyday life. Um, they may have a reduced speed of information processing. Their working memory might be limited. They may have difficulties with distractibility and impulsivity. And again, as with fine motor, with cognitive disability, thinking requires more effort, more vigilance. And so it can be very fatiguing to concentrate for people who have disabilities related to cognition. And there are lots of conditions that result in cognitive disability. So people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people who have strokes, people who have traumatic brain injury, lots of neurodegenerative conditions. Um, getting older, uh, you know, it relates to um, cognitive uh, decline. And so cognition is a, a really important factor to consider. And addressing accessibility for people with cognitive disability requires thinking about a lot of things that might be kind of common sense. So how do we how do we simplify the information? How do we provide support and guidance for people as they use the information? Are there ways that we can provide reminders or prompts? Can we make it so the structure of this um, this website or this data system is really consistent. So I know once I learn it, I can always get back in and use it again. And, and part of that is making sure that the navigation is very clear and very transparent. So just know that there aren't a lot of assistive devices or software uh, programs that focus on cognitive disability and data access. There are apps that kind of give us a clue to potential approaches that we might think about. So for example, on this screen, you see some reminder apps and visual schedule planners. And these are apps that provide structure, guidance, and reminders to help people um, consistently complete tasks. So, so these apps aren't relevant to data access, but they may give us a sense for things we should be thinking about. And then I'll just sort of forecast that, the, that another new technology that is going to be relevant to data access and understandable uh, understandability is uh, generative artificial intelligence, generative AI. And I know we've, we've, we've all been hearing about this in the news and there's a lot of concern and wonder about how this is gonna play out, but systems like ChatGPT um, may be able to simplify and explain data or to pull out highlights uh, and the important parts of a data report. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done before those systems are ready, and in particular work to remove bias from those systems, but there's also incredible opportunity um, to be able to help people access information in a way that is understandable and meaningful and allows them to use it. So what makes data inaccessible for people with cognitive disabilities? Well, obviously really complex textual or numeric information, um, systems without some guided support, um, having educational resources that are at a very high level and, and aren't appropriate for people who need things more simply, um, assumptions that are made about background knowledge. To Heather's earlier point, like if we make assumptions that only people with you know, bachelor's degrees are gonna be accessing the data, then um, we may be making assumptions that are inappropriate. And then of course, again, complex data visualizations that don't have some guidance about how to use them are gonna be challenging. So this is the last category I wanted to talk about, and this is, is reading disability. Reading disability is a, a type of learning disability. And what this means is that typically people um, will have difficulty in reading, but not in other skills. So learning disabilities, it, well, I probably don't need to explain this to that, this group. So, so there are three ways this can manifest. Um, first, many people have difficulties in photological processing. That is, they have difficulty learning sound symbol correspondence. And this is sometimes referred to as dyslexia. Some people have challenges related to fluency. Um, they, um, they may have some difficulty in word recognition and word spelling. And some people have difficulty with comprehension. They decode accurately, but they don't easily understand the meanings. 
And of course, many people with reading disabilities may experience more than one of these challenges. Um, just know that the assistive technology that's available is mostly useful for helping people with phonological processing and fluency. There's a little bit less that's, that's helpful for people who have language comprehension um, disabilities, but some of what we talked about earlier in the cognitive uh, arena may be useful. Um, so most AT for reading involves changing text to speech through software and, and, and other kinds of apps. So in, in other words, having the text read out loud so that it can be listened to. And the top image that you see here shows a software program called Claro Read Plus, and it works as a floating toolbar. It floats other, over other applications where the pe person might be working over you know, a website or a Word document. And so that's one way that people may uh, access information from text. These uh, software programs also often have other kinds of study tools, you know, ways that you can highlight and take notes and other supports for learning. And then um, people may also use a variety of mechanisms to get text into electronic format through scanning and op optical character recognition. So if the text is already electronic, that's great. But if it's in a book or it's in a hard copy, then you need to actually get it into electronic format so it can be read out loud. And in the picture you he see here on the bottom, someone's using a pen-like device and it's called the OrCam Read. And it, it actually, as you run it across the page, it scans text from a book and it reads it out loud or into a set of headphones. So for reading, data is inaccessible. If, certainly if information is only in text, then it can't, um, we can't get it into an audio format. And of course, if it, it's not, yeah, if it's not available to assistive technologies. So I want to move on. We've talked a lot about how people access data, what makes data inaccessible. Now we're going to talk at a very high level about principles of data accessibility. And as Heather noted, we're not going to get into technical details today, but this will hopefully give you an overview of some of the broad areas that need to be considered. So when we think about accessibility, it's useful to consider accessibility standards that have been developed over time. And the primary standard really for electronic information comes from the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Consortium Accessibility Guidelines. These are often uh, uh, referred to as WCAG. Um, and this is an international standard that explains how to make web content more accessible to people with disabilities. Um, and although the... Um, the, although the focus is on the web, just know it covers all sorts of information technology that may be displayed on the web, like PDFs and PowerPoints and so forth. And for those of you who are in state government, it's, it's important to note something that just happened. The Department of Justice just re, uh, released proposed revisions to the regulations that implement Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this is the part relevant to state and local governments. And in those uh, revisions, their they're proposed revisions, they include the adoption of specific technical standards and they directly reference WCAG for making accessible the services, programs, and activities offered by state and local government entities to the public through the web and mobile apps. And the reason this is important is because if these regulations are implemented, they're going to put a requirement on state and local government to ensure that their web content is accessible to WCAG, WCAG standards. Uh, I believe they're talking about WCAG level two. And there'll be some very clear uh, requirements around accessibility that will come into play. And then because the Y Center is also focused on more complex approaches to data visualization, I just wanted to point out that there's another project called Chartability. And if you Google it, you, you'll find it. And it's really um, focused on um, uh, developing a set of heuristics or testable questions for ensuring that data visualization systems and interfaces are accessible. So WCAG doesn't deal very much with complex data visualizations, uh, but Shardability is trying to think forward and it's actually added a few additional accessibility principles. So how does WCAG define accessibility? Um, WCAG categorizes standards into four main principles and the principles state that can't Tent needs to be perceivable, it needs to be operable, it needs to be understandable, and it needs to be robust. And the, the first letters of those principles spell out the word pour, like pouring water. 
So let's talk about each of those um, briefly. Perceivable means that information needs to be presented in a way that users can perceive it using one of their senses. In other words, a user has to be able to comprehend the, the information being presented. It can't be blocked from all senses. And so some examples of things that you might need to do here are um, things we've already talked about. Um, provide captions for audio content. Um, provide descriptions for video and graphic content. And then some other things like uh, allow for both landscape and portrait modes. Uh, don't use color as the only way to convey information. Uh, make sure you have a high enough color contrast uh, ratio. Um, make sure that your text can be resized without losing content or functionality. And all of these connect to having content that's perceivable. Operable means that all users need to be able to effectively navigate your website. Um, so if your site requires users to interact in a way that's not possible for them, then your website doesn't meet this principle. Users have to be able to interact with components of the page, mm -hmm. like the navigation features and the user interface. And so, for example, people who can't use a mouse, they should be able to effectively navigate your website using just a keyboard or voice controls. So um, examples are, you know, that again, that users can manage your whole site through using just their keyboard or that if you have animations or video content that sort of starts automatically, users should be able to pause that um, to, um, to scroll through it and to have some control over it. Um, you need to have pages that have proper titles and proper focus order. So focus order means that when a screen reader comes to a page, it knows where to start to read the, um, the page correctly. And those are all examples of, of things that fall under the operable principle. Moving on, understandable is exactly what it sounds like. Users need to be able to understand the information as well as understand how to operate the user interface. So some examples of that are, um, uh, you know, web pages need to, to tell screen readers what language is being used on the page because that makes a difference in terms of how the the text will be read out loud. Um, labels need to be provided when content requires um, input from the user. For example, on forms, it should be clear what information needs to be put into forms. If there are navigation mechanisms that are reported uh, or rather repeated on multiple pages, they need to be in the same order on every page. It, it needs to be, you need to be able to come to a page, learn it, understand it, use it, and not have to, have to um, kind of figure it out. And finally, the last one, robust, is really more of a technical standard. Um, content needs to be robust enough that it can be used by a wide variety of assistive technologies. Um, so um, the WCAG encourages that your website really needs to have a maximum compatibility across technologies, and it needs to be able to um, uh, be something that can be uh, appropriately used by future technologies. So it can't be sort of something custom. It needs to be something that fits into the standards, the tech standards that are in use. So these are these are the four principles. Again, th this is a very high level overview of the kinds of things that you're going to be learning more about. But I just want to bring us back to the whole point of the discussion, which is, is the broader goal that we're trying to meet through the Weiss Center. And that goal is equivalent data access. And I think it's it's important to like hold that in our brain. We're after equivalent data access for people with disabilities. And what that means is people with disabilities can access the same information with the same level of effort as people without disabilities. So it shouldn't be harder for people to get this information and they shouldn't get different information. They should get uh, the, be able to get the same information with the same level of effort. So this is the last section where we're, we're uh, almost done. We'll have time for questions. So what are some things that you can do to provide equivalent IDA data access to people with disabilities within your states? And so here are some high level ideas. First, you can begin to work to develop a culture that values access. And this can be as simple as, as taking on the role of a, what we might call reminder in chief. And you can be that person in the room who always says, but what about people with disabilities? Or have we thought about accessibility? Um, and just know that the needs of people with disabilities are often over, overlooked because they aren't in the room. 
So you can be that person in the room who advocates for them. And doing this likely will lead others to, to then remember and pay attention to these issues. You can also find ways to bring people with disabilities into the room with you. So include them in your accessibility work and ask them what they need and what they want instead of trying to imagine what they might want. You know, have them show you barriers they're encountering, put them in leadership roles, uh, hire them into critical positions where they can have an impact. These are important ways that you can kind of move the, move the needle forward. Um, you can also make time yourself to develop your own skills, to learn and develop skills in data accessibility. And just know that this is gonna be a big part of future webinars coming from the, the WISE Center. And so there's more to come and more opportunity for you to become uh, the expert who, who understands data accessibility in your state. And finally, you can work to create systems that ensure accessibility is consistently implemented. And it, it is so common in state, in state agencies for someone to come into a position to develop an expertise in accessibility and then to move on to a new job, maybe in another state. And when they leave, all their expertise and all their effort leaves with them. And so accessibility gets ignored again. And so think about ways that you can put into place procedures, processes, systems, frameworks to ensure that that doesn't happen, that accessibility doesn't just rely on the one person who really cares about it. And with that, I just wanted to leave you with a, an, an item for reflection. And that is this, you know, we've, we've presented a lot of information. It can be daunting. What would be your first action toward providing equivalent data access to people with disabilities? I think the key here is just to start, just to find a place to begin and know that it will take time, but that um, engaging in the effort is well worth it, both, both for you and your, your agency and your organization, but also, of course, for people with disabilities as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Darren, uh, who will wrap us up, and then we'll have an opportunity for Q&A. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Heather. This is Darren speaking. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for hanging with us here. We are approaching the end of our webinar. One thing that we did want to plug before we get to the Q&A is our next webinar. So we have a webinar coming up that will be covering document accessibility. And you can see here it's a basic overview of incorporating universal design. That webinar will be taking place on Thursday, November 16th, 2023, 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern. And in the chat, you will find the registration for that event. This event was really organized um, organized and planned in response to the field. There is a very, uh, very prevalent need for document accessibility. That has been something that has that has been a uh, a very high level or a very, um, I'm trying to think of the word, it's been a focal point of a lot of folks. It's been on top of folks' minds. Um, and this training will dive into a couple of components. Obviously, accessibility is a very complex and nuanced topic. Uh, but from this upcoming webinar, we hope you can take away some tips, some tricks, so that you can improve the accessibility of your products, of your services. Um, so again, that is in the that is in the chat right now. And if you'd move to the next slide, please. And also wanted to share with you an evaluation survey. So I'm also putting in the chat a link to our external evaluation survey. We, the Weiss Center, along with other OSET data centers, uh, are required to have an external evaluator. So this survey, there's a QR code on your screen as well. Uh, this QR code will take you to this survey. Your feedback will be anonymous and your feedback will help us inform our future webinars, our future offerings, uh, our approach to technical assistance. So please, any and all feedback is encouraged. It is welcomed. Um, and wanted to give folks a chance to, to access that. You can ask your questions there. Uh, the next slide after this will be a Q&A slide. Um, so if you do not have questions right now, but maybe you want to mull this over a little bit, all the content that you just heard, please feel free to put your questions in that survey. Um, and I would like to start off the Q&A section uh, with a question that I see in chat, Mark and Heather. Uh, what's the biggest area What's the biggest area of opportunity for accessible data? Where is the Rhonda Weiss Center focusing its efforts? Um, and I will uh, refer to uh, Jenny. Jenner, uh, Jennifer Schaff is our 
technical assistance lead for the Wise Center, who put a response in chat uh, that we're working on tools and products to help state staff build their skills in creating accessible data and documents. We're also creating a technology tool that will make IDEA data accessible. Um, so, Ian, please let me know if you if there's anything else that uh, you would like us to cover. And just looking at that question, uh, it's one thing it's got me thinking of while perhaps others are thinking about their questions. Uh, Mark and Heather, I know that I can speak from personal experience that getting started with accessibility can sometimes feel like a daunting task because it's it is you know it's it is a complex a complex thing. There are a lot of things to take into consideration. Uh, where I found it helpful to start was the built-in accessibility checkers and all of the things that I use, like the Microsoft suite of tools. There's Adobe, um, and I know that a lot of folks, especially in the special education data world, you know, we work in Excel, we work in Word. Um, so those tools are readily available. Have like what have you found or come across in terms of the effectiveness of those accessibility checkers? Are they, do you find that they're pretty thorough? Do they leave something to, to be desired? I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. I've never actually asked the two of you, um, mm -hmm. so I'd be curious. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think accessibility checkers are a great place to start. The, the challenge with a lot of them is they do rely on you having some background knowledge because um, they're, they're programmatically identifying things. And then you have to look and say, Oh yeah, that's that is an accessibility problem, or or no, it's not. I actually have um, I have done something. For example, with this PowerPoint today, PowerPoint kept telling me I hadn't checked the order of um, my uh, something on a slide when I had. So I was able to say, okay, that's fine. Um, so I think that, that that they're a great place to start. They're also a good place to because they will kind of force you to do some background learning to figure out what it's trying to ask you to fix. Um, and so that can be a good way to get started as well. Um, but but do know that they will require you to, um, to to come in and develop a little bit of knowledge in order to use them. There's a, so obviously the built-in ones <coughs> within um, Adobe Acrobat, within the, the Microsoft um, tools, but also there's a, a tool called um, Wave that you can install uh, on your your website would be Chrome or Edge or whatever, and it will it will help you uh, identify accessibility issues in a web page. Um, and then one of the resources I like, I think it's pretty strong, is a, a organization called Web Aim Web Accessibility in Mind. Um, their website's webaim.org, and they have an, a number of nice little pieces, uh, some about document accessibility and so forth, and, and that can be a good place to start learning. Um, I think that, uh, you know, Jenny's leading the TA um, uh, initiative, and I'm sure that there'll be a lot more materials coming out of the Weiss Center as well, focusing on those things as well. Um, I don't know, Jenny, if you want to add anything to that. Well, thank you, uh, Mark. Yeah, that, that was helpful. Um, There's another question. I'd be curious if if folks on the, the call who may be chiming in from a state, um, if there are states particularly ahead of the curve in terms of creating accessible accessible data, whether that be accessible IDEA data or just accessible data in general, um, you know, as we wait for anybody or anybody to chime in on that. Mark and Heather, I'm not sure if in, you know, your experiences, obviously don't want to call out any particular, you know, state organization. We're all doing our best. And that's what the Y Center is here to do to help states in this regard. Um, but I don't know. I'd be curious to, to see what maybe you have come across. Heather, you might have more experience working in statewide data systems than I do. I'm, I I don't know that I have a, a response there, but go ahead. Yeah, this is Heather. Thanks for that question. Um, unfortunately, I can think of a lot of instances of worst case scenarios <laughs> rather than necessarily leaders in the field. Um, I, I would say that one of the biggest barriers that I've accessed uh, across trying to extract state level data is that many states um, don't have statewide systems um, that state agencies, for example, uh, I'm trying to pick something. We'll talk about the criminal justice system, very outside of, of this group um, that, you know, 
lots of states produce similar data, but uh, oftentimes in, in criminal justice data, uh, different counties will use their own data systems, have different queries, different databases. They often don't even necessarily communicate well with each other. Uh, and that is really a quagmire uh, to try to, even as a non-disabled person accessing data, but certainly in terms of accessibility features, um, that becomes not just a, a second thought, but a third or fourth kind of afterthought. So the more streamlined systems can be that they can interact with each other, the easier it is to implement uh, these kind of accessibility features that can be replicated across systems. Um, but again, oftentimes individual agencies don't have control over um, different, uh, oftentimes it's the a state agency will be the depository for data and have less control about uh, how data is handled at even more local levels. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Did you have a comment? I was just going to add, um, we're not releasing information about individual states, but we did do an overall sweep just to look at some state data. And we found that some states had data that were easier to find. Um, and other states were even hard to find, let alone be accessible once you find it. We also found that few states were posting a policy about accessibility for data, which is another um, place that I'd encourage folks to start. Like Heather was saying, if you don't have a policy or an organizational structure, then it's, it's you know, you just have a hodgepodge. Um, but I wanted to add, too, that we are starting to work with states intensively. I did mention in the chat, and Darren read out about a tool we're creating, but states may not want to avail themselves of the tool once it's available. And we are here to help work with states. They may have a particular need, for instance, a stakeholder meeting that they want accessible materials for, or our help with the website or any particular materials. In, in, in Overall, most states seem to be linking to just the plain uh, 508 accessible theoretically PDF document that OSEP um, requires for the 616 SPP APR data. And I'm sure as anyone who's tried to look at that report, even as you know, a cited person, it's not fun. It's not, it's not really easy accessible for anyone. So we're gonna we're gonna try to help with that. Thanks, Sandy. And I would just add, um, and, and I don't, I'm not uh, trying to use fear tactics here, but I do think it's really relevant that the DOJ is moving forward to put into place regulations in Title II for the Americans with Disabilities Act. And I've been sitting in on listening sessions that the Department of Justice has been holding, and um, <clears throat> states are nervous, and they should be. Um, but a lot of what I'm hearing is they are worried that they don't have um, kind of technical expertise and per the, the the personnel who have capacity to do the work, and so just just keeping that in mind. I, I mean, whether these re revised regulations go through or something different, I, I think there's enough pressure that eventually there will be stronger standards for accessibility in states, and it will be some. So it's it's worth paying a little attention to now. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Heather. Um, with that, uh, we're at one minute to the top of the hour. Um, so just take this moment to thank everybody for, for sitting in, for coming. Really appreciate your participation today. Again, we have a our next webinar. We'll address some of those topics that we've talked about here in, in greater detail, um, mainly the components of making documents accessible, the three major components, that is. So please feel free to register for that. We look forward to seeing you all. And again, thank you very much for coming. You enjoy the rest of your day.